uh, we want to just jump right into it like we do. So uh, first of all, we are thrilled to have Mr. Bruce Bushnell. Uh, Bruce has centered his career around promoting youth success. He's an award-winning school counselor. He was named the Counselor of the Year for the state of Utah, was also honored at the White House, uh, receiving national recognition for his counseling interventions. Bruce has been a member of the Executive High School Relations Board, Senior Vice President of the Alpine School, uh, Alpine Counseling Association, Vice President of the Utah Counselors Association. He uh, now helps youth succeed by presenting on behalf of the Y-Tri organization, uh, keynotes and trainings across the country. He's an advocate of the program from his very earliest days. He's also been a key contributor in developing many of the Y-Tri learning activities, some of which we'll, uh, we'll talk about today. Welcome, Bruce. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Looking forward to this. And next we have uh, Corey Anderson. Uh, Corey has spent nearly two decades as an educator, beginning as a teacher, then as an administrator. He, he, uh, he's been an assistant principal at a middle school. He served as a principal of two different elementary schools. He helped pioneer and start one of two public STEM program, programs in the state of Utah and helped consult with the State Office of Education on creating STEM standards for schools that would eventually be adopted by the STEM Action Center. Um, he's also served as an elementary school principal, overseeing behavior units, and uh, led his school in implementing social and emotional programs and STEM activities. Uh, Corey joined the Y Tri organization uh, in 2019, and it's uh, just been awesome to have you. Welcome, Corey. Thank you. And then I am uh, Jason Johnson, uh, school psychologist. I came uh, I came over to the Y Tri organization about uh, about five years ago, and it's it's just been awesome. I oversee kind of research development and uh, and training, and similar to, to Corey and Bruce, we all wear a lot of hats, so we all. I represent the Y Tri organization now, and, and it's been fun to kind of lead out on important discussions about social emotional learning and resilience uh, throughout the country. So I'm, uh, I'm going to, I guess, serve as moderator and get this, uh, get this thing going. So I think, um, I think what we'll do, I'm just going to throw it over to Corey and let Corey kind of kick off the conversation. Um, about engagement, and uh, and we'll just go from there. We're going to plan on going for about an hour and uh, see how much we can fit in during that time. Okay, awesome. I good to go. I am yes, good to go. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm uh, I'm excited to be a part of this uh, webinar today about attendance and how to engage and re-engage students um, when there's been a behavior issue um, and. You know, when I was invited to be a part of this, I find it so ironic that I'm a part of a, of a webinar about uh, attendance and engage, uh, engagement. Um, I was the kid who in fifth grade discovered that you didn't necessarily have to go to school, right? Like if I stayed downstairs and hid under my bed and waited for my mom to go out the front door, I, I didn't have to go to school. I could just spend the whole day at home. And, and then I realized I could do that two days in a row and then three days in a row, four days in a row. And, and of course the school would call home. So I would go and take the phone off the hook so that the phone call couldn't get through. <laughs> and before long, I had, I had missed uh, uh, two weeks of school before I finally thought, oh, well, maybe I should go back to school. <laughs> so then I go to school. And of course, one of my best teachers ever, Mr. Rogerson, he pulls me aside. He's like, Corey, where you been? And I can't get a hold of your parents. Why? And then I was horrible at lying. And it took him all two seconds to tell me what that meant. So anyway, but now here I am talking about the importance of attendance and, and how to try to re-engage students when they, when they go back to school. So I'm excited about that. You know, my relationship with attendance has been really interesting over the years. As a teacher, when I first started as a teacher, you kind of have this sense and this feeling of, well, there's only so much I can do with attendance, right? Like I, once the kids are here in my class, then they are all mine and I will do everything I can, I guess, to help them learn um, academically and, and, and to meet their needs. But if they don't come, that's just all she wrote. Like, I, I can't do anything about that. And, and I think as a teacher, that was my mentality as a very, you know, early on new teacher, not really understanding uh, what I know now. And when I transitioned to administration, I think I had a better, I started to understand more and more how important attendance was. Like I said, I, it was early on when I had that other mindset, but 
as an administrator, you quickly learn how imperative, how necessary attendance is. There's so much correlation between attendance and, and student outcomes. It's just, we know how important it is. And so as an administrator, you are tasked with this, this, uh, this responsibility to try to increase attendance and to focus on it and to try to figure out ways to get kids to school. And when they get to school, to keep them in school. And, you know, as an early administrator, as you are kind of learning the systems, it didn't take long for me to see that a lot of it came down to like a punitive approach where we are meeting with parents and their kids and I'm pulling out this PowerPoint that is mandated by our state rules and whatever state you guys are in, I'm sure you have a different set of standards or rules or, or things that you go through that are similar to our own here, but it was like, you have to make them aware and you take them through actual state law and then you'd bring in parents and go through state law. And it was just like a scare tactic of, you know, you better come to school or else you could be held accountable sort of thing. And then, you know, it's attendance is a really interesting one because when we have kids in schools, you know, there's lots of things we can do, but when they're not coming to school, what consequence are you given, right? Like your, your options are very limited. And so this punitive approach, it, it didn't necessarily work so well. And so then, you know, there was kind of a push for trying to create extrinsic rewards. And I remember doing lots of that where we would have, you know, ice cream parties or, or giveaways for students that would attend school to try to get them to come. And then when they would come, you know, help them be motivated. Listen, you can earn this if you come to school. So you kind of started falling back on these extrinsic rewards. I remember, you know, as a principal finding out this one girl of mine, when she got to sixth grade, she had not missed a single day of school. And I was so excited for, I, I ran out and bought an iPad and brought it to her and we presented it to her on the last day of school. I was so proud of her for attending every day, but you know, even those extrinsic rewards they are to a certain extent, you know, superficial and they're not going to do the job long-term in my opinion. And I think I really discovered that the key to attendance and to trying to re-engage students and to keep them there and to increase in attendance really does come down to how we engage our students. And I really learned that lesson first off when I was, uh, when we did the STEM program at one of the elementary schools, you know, the, the STEM program had a lot of engaging activities. It was built on engagement and creating active engagement for students. And I remember we had a student that had had some attendance issues and they had started off and, and was in the STEM program and we saw great changes in them. And I remember one day his grandpa came to the office to check him out for his birthday, to take him to lunch. And he was standing just outside my office with his grandpa. And I heard him say to his grandpa, I, I don't want to go. <laughs> I want to stay in class and do this activity. And I remember thinking, oh yes, hallelujah. I mean, that's why we did this, right? Like we, we wanted to create all of these engaging opportunities so that students would make that statement right there. Um, you know, I think one of the great things about um, SEL is SEL has a unique opportunity to create engaging experiences for students to try to create that desire to be there. In the old days, we could rely on just, listen, this is what you do. It's your responsibility to be in school. And if you don't, you know, you're going to hear from the principal. But nowadays, it's, uh, we have to take a bigger role in creating that engagement and that excitement for them to be there. I know that's a big task and I know it's hard but it's kind of reality. And everything I just described is pre-pandemic. So now in the midst of the pandemic, where it feels like we have even less of an influence and control over students at home, gosh, the only thing that I can think of to really try to help students see the importance or, or at least begin to attend school is to create engaging opportunities where they want to be there. And that, like I said, is a big task. It's a big task. But I think that there are opportunities out there to do it, especially through social emotional learning. And, uh, and specifically in Y-Try, that's something we try to do. In fact, our three R's are principles on what the foundation of our social emotional learning is built on is 
building a relationship with students so that they want to be around you, right? So that, so that they buy into you and then making learning engaging for them by making it relevant, right? So our first principle is relationship. Our second principle is making things relevant and engaging for students and all in an effort to make them resilient, which is our third R so that they can bounce back when, you know, challenges and trials come along. Um, and so I really do believe in this idea that the best way to increase attendance with our students is to create a warm, caring, engaging environment. And, and how do you do that, especially in a pandemic world right now where all kids have to do is click the off button? Well, that's intimidating, but I think that's why we're here, right? Just to try to give a few examples of what we're talking about by creating engaging environments. Is there, is there anything, Jason or Bruce, that you want to add to this before I kind of launch into maybe some of the strategies that we would even use to engage students? No, I just agree with you, Corey. Just that relationship is so important. And we have over 50 strategies and we're creating more of how you can send a, a strong message that we care about students. We want them to be there and we need them and that uh, they and that we respect them. And once you have that relationship, there's a greater opportunity for them to show up. Then it, then it comes to the, again, being relevant, engaging for them. So uh, hopefully Jason at the end will have about two minutes to show you just kind of some of the things, you know, just a few where, where those things are in our curriculum. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate that. Yeah. So where we're going to be headed, we want to share some, some strategies we use and we recommend to create an engaging environment and get kids there and, and willing to be there. Um, I think one of the concerns that definitely comes up and we can kind of answer it throughout as we go when, when, you know, Bruce and Jason and speak, they, they can share their thoughts on it as well. But also during this pandemic um, time, we have heard lots about, you know, gosh, sometimes it's hard to even get them to come the very, very first time, right? To even click on the camera. And that one is a challenge because that is the scenario where you have the absolute least control, right? Like, how do you get them to listen even the first time? And I like something you said to me, Bruce, earlier, where you said, you know, you have to give them a reason to be there at the very beginning. And you may have to be creative. And we've brainstormed some of those. Um, but you're going to have to be creative in coming up with a reason for them to be there and reach out to them in a different way other than, oh, listen, when they get on my Zoom call, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make magic happen and they'll want to be there. You're going to have to reach out to them outside of that Zoom call and give them a reason to be there, whether that's some sort of like competition or, hey, listen, we're going to do a music day and I want you to bring, you know, a song that you love and share it, or we're going to have like a competition for the craziest hats or we're, whatever it is, whatever clever technique based on your, your age group of students, you have definitely got to find a way to get them to, to turn on that camera the very first time. And then you got to be prepared to uh, engage them right away. Otherwise you may lose them. And I get that we're really talking about our tier three kids here. You know, generally speaking, a lot of our kids are going to tune in, um, from the get-go, but you are going to miss some that you have to reach out specifically to. Okay, I'm going to move on to our strategies. Sound good? Okay. So, you know, one of the th approaches we really take with kids is trying to find opportunities to build connections with them and give them voice, give them an opportunity to participate, and in some ways, even participate without them um, even, even having to say a word. And so the more you can build what we consider to be a safe environment, um, the more likely they are going to keep coming back and coming back. And that engagement is going to increase. I am actually going to attempt to share a screen right now. And that is always uh, a little scary as we transition. Okay. I just took that over. I'm assuming you can see that. Yep. It's good. Okay. Awesome. Um, so the screen you can see up there, guys, um, says values continuum. And I want to do a quick example for you of maybe one of our, what we consider to be one of our relationship building activities and something that you can do with students to start to establish a rapport and, a, and a, create a classroom environment with them where they feel things are safe to share and to interact and to even see connections with each other. And we're actually going to do it in a virtual setting. We love doing this activity. 
in a live setting with students because it's engaging, it gets them moving and all of that. But the reason we picked this is because it's also very, very possible to do in a virtual setting. And so the values continuum, if you were to imagine that line segment up on the screen, that is a values continuum where one end of it represents something and the other end of it represents something else. And you get to place yourself anywhere you want to on that line to show how you feel about those two subjects, right? And in a real scenario, we would put a piece of duct tape across the room and have kids go and stand where they see themselves on the line. But in a scenario like this, it could be as simple as putting up a poll question and even showing one of them. So for example, um, where are the poll questions on here? Do you, do you have that option on yours, Jason? Um, yes, I do. You Will you throw that? up? I, do, I don't, so it must be you. Will you throw up the first poll question for us? So the first poll question, actually, will you exit that now? My bad. Is this still up? Yeah, it is. Actually, I exited it. So the way the values continuum works is, for example, it may be as simple as which do you prefer, the mountains or the beach, right? And you put up these two values on opposite ends. Now you can throw up the poll question. You throw up a poll question for students to be able to put in their answer. And they could use the chat window or you could use some sort of functionality like this. And you guys out there, you guys can actually answer this. So if you're sitting there staring at this, feel free to reach out and click on it and we will see your answers. Which do you prefer, the mountains or the beach? Are they answering, Jason? Yep. Okay, because I can't see it on my end. So we'll just give you a 10 seconds. We're not gonna have time for you to go through every one. Five, four, three, two, one. Jason, do you wanna share that up there? Jason can even share the results. You can see, you know, 38% of you said the beach, 40 or 9% of you said the mountains, and then you're scattered across that, right? Some of you put yourself dead center. I'm really interested, actually, really quickly in the chat window. I know this is going to fly, but for anybody who chose the beach, why the beach? Like, why, what, what's your rationale? What's your reasoning for choosing the beach? What do you think? Okay, the calming, I'm singing the warmth. Some of you are from Hawaii. You're like, it's, we've got both, right? <laughs> I hate the cold, right? There's a million answers there. I can't go through them all, but you can see how that would be a lot of fun to do with your students. And as you invite them to share what they were thinking and why they chose that, you get to have great dialogue and interact with them, right? So that can be a great experience. We have lots of different suggestions. Let me, let me try another one with you. Um, let's do poll. Let's do values continuum number three, Jason, if you don't mind. Values continuum number three. Which do you prefer, hamburgers or pizza? Hamburgers or pizza, right? And then you're able to answer. I'm just going to give you a few seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. If you'll close it, show the results. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you please repeat it? <laughs> and you can see in this scenario, pizza won out, right? And then you sit and talk about it. Just so you guys know, you know, um, there's so many different things you can do here, right? Some of the ones that we put up as an example, sports car SUV, hamburgers, pizza, pie and cake, dogs and cat. With kids, you can do playing video games versus playing sports different genres of music. You can even start tying it into some of more of the social emotional learning lessons like being smart and working hard. Um, and then you can get into even more serious discussions, which is more dangerous, marijuana or alcohol, right? So there's so many different things you can do with a values continuum, but the value of the activity is that it's very engaging. Students start to see what they have in common with each other and you learn more about your students. And if you are doing these type of engaging activities with your students, it's going to propel them more and more to want to come and participate and be a part of your class. Jason, yes, you're sir. Up. What do you got for us? Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, awesome job, Corey. So that he did that very, very quickly, but that's a super fun activity that kind of creates engagement. And I like to, when I use that with kids, I like to use that in conjunction with 
um, discussing some of our, our group, like a virtual group um, rules for, for engagement. And really what we're trying to do is create the, the feel of a safe space where people can express ideas freely and, and kind of feel safe in that community. There's been a lot of, of recent um, research and discussion coming out about um, like how to create trauma-informed virtual classrooms and pretty consistently throughout the, the, the literature on that, it talks about the importance of one, building relationships, and then two, offering some sense of control or influence on the environment, and then ultimately making sure that we create virtual environments that feel safe, feel welcoming, and can kind of inspire hope in kids. And so an activity like that is really nice because it, it offers up all of those. We learn about each other, we're building relationships, and we're listening to one another. And so that sense of uh, kind of voice and choice where they get to share how they feel is really, really, really vital. And so that's, um, those are pretty significant things. Uh, so I'm just, what I wanna do is I wanna share with you just some specific strategies that I use when I am uh, working with kids right now. I'm gonna speak in reference to a virtual setting because I think that's kind of the heaviest on people's minds right now. Um, this is a common one that, that people do, but I, um, I always start my, um, whatever my virtual presentation is with some type of engaging questions. I'm gonna put up a couple that I like to use now. So this is usually how I'll welcome people and I'm gonna let you, you can just respond in the, uh, in the chat tool. Uh, first question, so if I was welcoming you into, into a virtual lesson today, um, this is something that I might have on the screen. Go ahead and respond in the chat tool. If money and COVID wasn't an obstacle, you could visit anywhere in the world, where would you go? And so I'm giving people an opportunity to share their ideas. And then we'd pick a few of them out. And by the way, you're giving me great ideas and making me uh, really homesick for the road. Oh my goodness. God, they're going all over the world. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. We need to organize a, a travel group. Uh, maybe when, when this is done, we can all go on a virtual trip together. And uh, <laughs> so I'll welcome. So, so I've created space where you can share your ideas freely now. And this is what I, I welcome you into. So I'm trying to create that, that virtual space, you know, where people, where people can, can jump in. Another one that I like to ask, I'm going to put this one up as well, and you can use the, the chat tool. Um, this one's one of my favorites. Uh, what's the best thing you've read or watched recently? We've all had downtime during COVID. Um, so tell me, what are you, oh, we got, oh, this is my favorite. Street, <laughs> Queen's Gambit. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There's more, by the way, there's more TV shows on here than there are books, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you. Um, but I'll throw this out there, you know, something like this to welcome welcome people to my, my virtual space. And now this has given you space to share your ideas. We'll pick out a few and we'll talk about them, and, and it, it can be fun. So this, these type of things obviously are creating engagement with the kids that are showing up. Um, the, the next thing I want to talk about, I think, reaches into engaging the kids that are showing up, but can also be a useful tool in um, engaging the kids or trying to engage the kids that aren't showing up. And this is something that I'm really passionate about. In fact, it, it's something that, uh, that I learned early on as a school psych. So my first year as a school psych I went through like this whole cycle of kind of self-doubt. There was, I was immediately kind of just slapped in the face with the reality of what I was doing. I had limited resources within some of the schools. I was dealing with the toughest situations within the schools. And you find out really quickly that all of the role plays you did during grad school end up, <laughs> end up finishing up much more neatly than the experiences that you have in real life. And about two weeks in to being a school psych, I had a, an experience that really kind of changed my trajectory. And it, it helped me realize 
the, the power of this tool that I already had a passion for, but I had never really figured out how to use in a, a professional setting, but it's something that I still use today. And I think it's one of the most powerful tools we even have in a virtual setting. And it's the, the power of music. So I, uh, I had a kid that did a, he did a thing that was, was pretty problematic. Um, he, he got in an altercation and, uh, and created a, a scenario where some pretty severe discipline had to take place. And um, the, uh, the principal brought him into my office. The principal was furious and brought him into my office and said, you need to deal with this. And he kind of, the principal walked away and was trying to, trying to gather himself to, uh, to figure out what to do. And so this kid sat down across from me and I'm kind of rubbing my hands together. I'm a, I'm a two week fresh school psych. And I'm like, all right, I guess it's go time. And, uh, and <laughs> this, so I sit and I look at him and I go, so uh, tell me what's going on. And he wouldn't make eye contact with me and he wouldn't talk. And so talk about, you know, a student that wouldn't engage. This was a student live in person with me that wouldn't engage at all. He wouldn't even make eye contact with me. So he sat there in silence for like 30 long seconds. I tried another question. Uh, sounds like a pretty rough day. You wanna, you wanna tell me what happened? Still, he's just bouncing his knees up and down. He won't make eye contact with me. He won't say a word. And I'm starting to sweat now. And I'm thinking maybe I've made a, a pretty <laughs> severe professional mistake. And finally, kind of out of desperation, I just had this thought. I was like, you know what? I got nothing left. I had expired all my all my, um, my uh, best practices that I'd been taught in grad school. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to try something and, and see what happens. I opened up my computer, opened up to YouTube, and I handed in my laptop. And I said, look, I, I realized um, you probably came in here expecting a lecture. I kind of thought it was my job to give you a lecture. I apologize to him. I said, first of all, I'm sorry. I wish I could redo the last five minutes, but we can't. Um, but we need to be productive. I, I need to find out what's going on. I want you to find me a song on YouTube that, that tells me either what's going on, how you feel, or who you are. And he looked up and he gave me this kind of suspicious look. He goes, it's against the rule for students to use YouTube, Mr. Johnson. Go, well, my office, my rules, find me a dang song. And he put his head down and he started, went to work to find me a song. And I knew what was going to happen. I knew he was going to find me something very abrasive to, to give me exactly what I asked for. And sure enough, he did. And we sat and listened to it. 30 seconds into it, he was more uncomfortable than I was. And he looks up, he goes, you can turn it off now, Mr. Johnson. I go, no way, dude. If this is you, I'm going to listen to it. And I listened to it. And then we got done and I said, hey, can I play you a song now to tell you who I am? And he goes, your office, your rules. And I thought, okay, I'm going to like this kid. So I played him a song and we exchanged about four songs in this really incredible moment. And from that time forward, he became that kid for me that would work for me, but wouldn't work for anybody, any other grown up in the building. So I was the one that would get called whenever he was really in a, in a problematic situation or when he wouldn't show up and we hadn't seen him for a week. And because we had made that connection, he would respond to me. And so when you look at the, like that trauma informed research that I talked about, the relationship, the connection piece is really, really vital. And that's, in, that is central to everything that we do. So as far as music, my recommendation for you, and this is something that I use still in my, uh, in my virtual presentations with adolescents or with grownups, but music has this power. Um, it, from a relevance standpoint, it's right at the center of the, the relevant lives of these kids that we're working with. And then from a, uh, um, from a kind of a voice and choice uh, position, it gives them an opportunity to express themselves kind of uniquely. Here's some stats that uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services put out on music and its relation to um, adolescents. It's students, number one, non-school related activity. 87% of 13 to 17 year olds report listening to music after school two thirds day music as a hobby. Adolescents spend between four and five hours a day listening to music and or watching music videos. That's gone up now with the, uh, with during the pandemic and with uh, the existence of TikTok now, which is all built around music and music videos. American teenagers listen to an estimated 10,500 hours of rock music between seventh and 12th grade. These numbers have only increased, and this was just looking at rock music 
Um, kids spend more time between kindergarten and 12th grade listening to music than they do in the classroom. So from a relevance standpoint, if you can include music in your message, it connects to their lives. And then from that voice and choice piece, it really gives them a way to express themselves. So I'm gonna give you a few tips here in just a minute of how I use music specifically. 90% uh, of students report knowing many or all the lyrics of their favorite songs. It penetrates our brains and stimulates our brains in a different way. So here's how I, um, here's how I like to use music um, specifically. So some general ideas are you use it before class. I always welcome people into my um, virtual classroom with music playing. It adds energy. Um, you can use it thematically with your concepts. During any type of movement activity, it's going to add energy, even during group discussions. So if I'm doing any type of group work in a virtual setting, I will play music. And I'll tell you in a minute how I select the music that I play. And then at the end of the class, the last thing I said, it, you can connect it, that message. Uh, so here's some specific strategies that I have that I, uh, that I like to use. And this is one of my favorite, favorite things in a virtual setting. Uh, first of all, I use music as a response or as like a journal response. So we have written journal responses. We'll do art journal responses sometimes. I love doing music journal responses. Give a journal prompt and I want you to respond with a song that represents your response to this question. Makes it really fun. Kids can express themselves. And I'm telling you, you can learn a lot if you take a minute to listen to the music that they listen to. Create a life sketch or tell your story with songs. So you can give, this is a great personal assignment. You can reach out to kids. Right now, when I'm setting up a virtual classroom and I'm trying to get kids to engage, the very first question I ask, and I will reach out to any capacity that I can, email, phone call, whatever capacity that I can, and I will ask kids, what is your favorite song right now? Or what is one of your favorite songs right now? And kind of collect those and these become my playlist. So it's the songs that they pick that I turn into the playlist that greets them when they join my class virtually or that I play during group discussions or activities. So they're now contributing to a class. And the, the nice thing about the universality of music is a, a few of you have talked about how right now it's, it's particularly difficult to engage our middle school and our high school students. Music is such a universal language for adolescents because it taps very deeply in to where they're at developmentally. And so when you can allow them to express themselves through music and bring that into your space, it starts to turn your virtual classroom into their virtual classroom, which is really, really powerful. Um, create a playlist. This is my very favorite activity. Create a playlist of songs. And elementary, it's the same. Now, elementary... What you may be looking at, they may not have as strong of opinions about music. And so for elementary, depending on, you, on what you have, you, if you're not up on pop culture, find a family member or friend that can help you and build playlists of the most viral songs that you can find for your elementary kids. Like in the last year, I've listened to way more Baby Shark than I wanted to. <laughs> but you know what? It, catch, it catches the attention of kids. Um, so I create these playlists. And then it, it, what it happens is it becomes really fun. When a student knows that they've submitted a song for one of your playlists, they have a slightly increased level of interest to show up because they want to hear if the song that they picked is going to be played. And so when I welcome them to class, I'll usually play through one or two songs and they're excited to hear if there is, is going to get played. And if it doesn't get played this week, hopefully it gets played next week. Um, Play name that genre with them. Uh, if I had more time, I actually had it queued up. I was going to play it with you guys, but I want to save some time for Bruce to do a little bit of a walkthrough. But that's super fun. That opens up a whole discussion about the importance of music. You can talk about listening and understanding. What is this genre trying to say? You can start having explorations and discussions about culture and some really, really important things that way. Um, and then in one-on-one -on -one settings, if for those that are doing that, use you can pick a day and use music to communicate rather than a spoken discussion. Pick a song that tells me how you feel right now or who you are. We're going to listen together and then I'm going to share one that tells you who I am. And so this is 
this is by far my favorite tool. So I'm telling you right now, when I get a new list of kids that I'm working with, the very first thing I do is I reach out to them and I see if I can find out what their favorite song is. And I tell them I'm building a playlist and I want you to help me build the playlist. You're the experts on this. When they're acknowledged as an expert on a thing that's going to be brought into the classroom, it turns your virtual setting into a much safer place that they're hopefully going to be more interested in engagement. And I've had good luck with it. I'm obviously very passionate about it. If you're un, if you haven't tried music or you don't feel like you're an expert on it, pick a kid to help you out that can kind of function as class DJ or whatever and lean into it and try it out. There, there really is a, a unique power to it, but it's one of my very, very favorite things for engagement and creating kind of creating that space because people are really proud. Right now, I've got a, a ongoing discussion with about five high school students that are pretty ambivalent towards school and virtual school right now. And the discussion is about one thing. I asked them to pick a song. If you could pick one song to help heal the world from the challenges of 2020, what song would you pick? And these kids, these five high school students that are not thrilled about engagement with school are fully engaged in this discussion because music has such a central role in their lives. Anyway, I, uh, I've probably said enough, but uh, <laughs> that's, uh, is, I, I really, really feel strongly about it. Bruce, I'm gonna throw it over to you. I don't think I have, yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna cover for now. So Bruce, I'm gonna throw hey. it over to you and let you talk about some strategies. I'm gonna now. go to share and- you stop my share. Okay, we're there. Okay, can, can you see me okay? Jason, are we okay? Can you see it? Yep, I can see okay. it. Okay. Anyway, music is a great way. And sometimes we have, you know, you can do it one-on-one -on -one or in a small group or a class virtually or, of course, live. We have four music CDs in Y Tribe that helps us get into other types of music. Sometimes I'm, I'm not as... Uh, talented in music as Jason have as much knowledge, but I use it all the time. Old Fuddy Dud, Mr. B, that's me. But I, I've reached so many kids in profound ways with music. And sometimes we'll say, hey, we're going to have a little competition. We're going to see, I'm going to put up a, a song and you tell me what movie it goes with. Or I'm going to, uh, let's see, we'll have a, put you in a chat room if it's virtual or in a group and then come up with so many different types of music as you can. And so, and then have, a, but you can have a competition. There's just so many things. And we use music all the time. And we use it, like Jason said, even in journaling as part of the journal activities we can engage kids with. So today we thought it'd be great. Maybe some people, one of our webinars said, could you just do kind of a mini lesson for your SEL curriculum? What a kind of lesson looks like. So I would call this kind of abbreviated lesson, but uh, it can't, what's great about it, it's flexible. You can do a lesson in 15 minutes. You can do one in half an hour, 45 minutes or whatever. So. Uh, Today, I've chosen to do a lesson that, um, that I like, that um, it's a, it's, we use visual metaphors in Why Try to, and vis, visual approach, basically, students can retain it and remember it for a long time. And I, because of the pandemic and all the things we're going on right now, for a lot of you are out there, maybe you're trying to come up with strategies in your school, or your district, engaging strategies. Well, you could even use this yourself personally as an adult or as a staff. How are we gonna jump the hurdle of getting students to show up virtually or to our class? So I'd like to just do this mini lesson, it's called Jumping Hurdles. And uh, the very first thing, the hurdle, we use the track analogy, the hurdle represents a challenge, a trial, trauma, of adversity, a problem you have or something that's very difficult to overcome or achieve. And that's your person. That's got to be your personal. And, and we share with some, we share with students some things on the leg just to get them thinking about jumping hurdles. Uh, we ask the question, "What have you jumped over before? What have you jumped over? Past successes." And so they can maybe review. Maybe I had a challenge before, but I was able to, to solve it or get over it or be more productive. Uh, the second one is, "What can I jump over?" It's got to be somewhat attainable or realistic. And then. The third, why should I jump this hurdle? What's in it for me? Why, why, why would it benefit me? What opportunities does it provide me? And then why try is a strength-based approach. And we, what's right with a student will help their strengths if we can 
get tap into those will help them to jump their hurdle. So before we have what before we go to uh, the steps of jumping hurdles, I like I have a, just a little uh, lesson for I mean a little object lesson. Uh, I know you all love math out there, so I'm, if if you want, to, usually you can. I'd like you to pick a number. We'll just keep it simple for right now. I'd like you to pick a number between one and ten, and don't share it with anybody. If you happen to be in a room with someone, but pick a number between one and ten. Don't tell anybody, but have it in your mind. You can't pick zero, so one up to 10. Now, once you've got that number, I would like you to double it or times it by two. So whatever number you're picked, times it by two. Now, after you've done that, the number you now have, I would like you to add 10 to your number. Okay, once you've added 10, to the number and you have the number you have after you've added 10, I'd like you to divide it by two. So once you've divided it by two, now from the number you now have, subtract the number you originally started with. You can keep that in your mind. I, maybe some of you are starting to lose it because I'm starting to lose it, but you subtract the number you originally started with from the number you, you just had, and then would like you to add I'd like you to add 11 to that number. Scratch that. I would like, <laughs> yeah. I'd like you to add 11 to that number. I got confused. I hope I did that right. Jason, I do that right? Yes, we'll find out. Yes, we will too. We will. So you subtract the number from the last number you had, then add 11. And I, I usually ham it up with students. I, and, you know, I go around and kind of, but uh, if you want it in the chat window, you have to put in the chat, we won't take the time. But if you uh, were able to follow me and I didn't totally lose you, uh, the number, the correct number that all of you have that I feel that you'll have, um, and it's usually the, the age when most students in most states get their driver's license. Should have had 16. Um, some of you go to the chat window and just put thumbs up or got 16. I just want to know that we did that right. I don't have to have a lot, but just a few of you go to the chat window. And I wanted I want to see if you were able to get that. We got we're so far down, I can't even see them. Do we get have some people with 16? Oh, yeah, lots of them. Okay, they're there they are. Bruce, there's some people that are amazed. They think you're a magician. I, 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 <laughs> I have that memorized, but I almost forgot the formula. So I didn't even, but it's, um, but engages students. And you can have any number between one to a hundred or even larger. If you want to have them do it with a pencil and paper and do it, or you can have them do it in their mind one through 10. But um, so that leads into, um, if you follow that formula and, follow those steps, you will get 16 every time. And I'm gonna share something right now, the six steps to jumping hurdles. So if you'll follow these steps, this formula of jumping hurdles, you'll have a great opportunity to get over your hurdle or make progress, move forward and be more productive in jumping your hurdle. And so I will share those with you. And, uh, and but remember that, you know, if you'll follow these, it, I use this all the time. My wife and I use this formula. It can be for all, us as staff and for our students. So here's the six steps for jumping hurdles. The first, the first step, identify the challenge or the hurdle, what you want to overcome, what you want to jump. And it's got to be yours for students. It's got to be something they own, something they really care about, something that's that you know it's important to them. Can't be someone else's hurdle or challenge. The second one, this is going to be fairly quick, is creating options creating opportunities, you know, the strategies of how you're going to overcome that hurdle. So for example, attendance, if that was the challenge, how am I going to start showing up? What are, you know, uh, us as adults, how are we going to get our students to start showing up? What are the options or strategies we think would be the best? We've shared a few today, but I used to teach a class for the health department on smoking sensation, helping young people quit smoking. And we, I asked them to come up with the strategies or options they heard of that help people to stop smoking. 
and they came up with all kinds of things, but I got things from the health department and they had about 80% of the things the health department supplied me with. And then they would go and pick one of those strategies or combine two and test them out and go out and try them out. Then they'd come back and say, that really worked for me, right? Maybe need to try a different strategy. You, we all can do the same thing, but we create options or ways or strategies we can get over that hurdle. The third step, get help. Who can help me get over this hurdle? That could be a you, a teacher, a counselor, administrator, whatever your role is. It could be a key adult, a parent. It could be a peer, a friend. It could be knowledge that you get from a book on the internet, but you get help. Getting help is a positive resource to help you jump hurdles. Then we always ask them, who could I help? Who or who could I invite to try to jump the same hurdle or help them with their hurdles? And number four is really critical. A lot of people tell you what they're going to do. Students have told me many times, Mr. B, I'm going to do this. But sometime you got to take action. And uh, taking action, you got to do something. And so taking action could mean sometimes stopping certain behaviors and then sometimes adding certain behaviors. For quitting smoking, they had to stop certain behaviors. They had to do something with their hands, with their time, replace it. They, but there's a variety of things they came up with. They had to start doing something. Sometimes that was to create a new passion, something they loved, added behaviors. But it's important, you gotta take action. I always tell students, I used to show the video clip, what about Bob? If you can't take big steps, take baby steps, but start moving forward, do something. And the fifth step I really like is to the power of belief and change. And we ask students on a scale from one to 10, where do you feel you are in being able to jump this hurdle or having success or to change? And so I'd like to throw this to the chat window. I hope we have time for that. We, we do just for a second. Just Jason, you can monitor that and read a couple, just read a couple. But how we think it's critical that students, we can help increase students' belief level as we teach this social emotional life skill. And so I'm throwing out to you, what, what's one, one or two strategies that'll help a student increase their belief level? Go, if they say they're two or three or four, how they could go to a five or six or the next one up. Anyway, if someone could just share that in the chat window, I would be interested, Jason, if you could read a couple of those for me. You bet, we've got uh, success in small steps, positive self-talk, talking about past successes, uh, growth mindset, set, a little uh, Carol Dweck um, That's awesome. response, a relationship with a caring adult, inner coach versus inner critic. Love that. Wow. We have an, that's an amazing. We could go on. That's, and that very same principle though, usually when I teach this, whether it's virtually or face to face, I'll ask the students and let them share their strategies. And then I may add something, but it's great when it comes from students some of the things they thought of, how they could increase that belief level. And so, but I, I, those are all awesome. And so we really believe that. And I think step five is critical. I used to, the coach used to say, if you can conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. And that's really true, but you've got to believe that you can do it. And then step six ties to our principle of resilience. Sometimes you're not going to be successful when you are trying to jump that hurdle. And so you need to know if you knock the hurdle over as you're jumping or you fall down, you got to jump back up and, and you got to bounce back. And that's part of being resilient. You never lose as long as you keep on. Uh, you only lose if you give up. Now, you could apply a lot of these principles to just attendance and engagement, but this, we believe teaching social emotional life skills, which we call the skills of resilience, gives students the tools and the ability and the skills so they can navigate more through their challenges. And once they do show up and they start incorporating, learning these, these uh, skills, they can be more successful in all their classes, all the things that we want them to face and so, or deal with. Now, I would like to show, we, we, use, we have video clips that we use. I'm going to show a video clip. It's very short. Tell me how this video clip ties to step six, jumping back up.
anyway, that gives that's amazing on that sequence. We asked students, how could that possibly tie to step six, jumping back up? Well, this was a commercial and the, per, the, the, the group that was trying to do this commercial wanted that sequence you just witnessed or saw to occur in a natural progression, every sequence, and without stopping it or without trick photography or anything. I still don't know how tires go up, but I did get an A in physics, but that's been a long time ago. But, but how does that possibly relate to step six? But students, they'll tell you that what they think, but th this particular automobile company had to they, had, they shot that 696 attempts. And I tell students, you will not have to, uh, you will not have to maybe jump your hurdle 696 times, but it's not gonna be perfect all the time. It's gonna take time. So in this lesson, we have in our white tri curriculum, I don't wanna go there, but in our white tri curriculum, we have a variety of activities. I'm not gonna do this activity today, but we have what was called 15 pencils, but we have over approximately 15 to 20 activities for every social emotional life skill that we're teaching that are engaging and quite a few of those like 15 pencils very engaging then over and over again can be done virtually and or definitely in person and so successful people have everybody has challenges but successful people figure out solutions or strategies or the ability to work through those challenges and that's what the skill we're trying to teach so anyway I get excited about it, even though we didn't have a lot of time for that. It's still a mini lesson that you could do. We just did it virtually, so if we, and, and so that's something, again, you could use to engage your students once you've got them there. So, Jason, turn it back to you. Thank you. I'll stop my share. There you go. Uh, thank you. Well, this has been, this has been fun. We just got about five minutes left. Um, let me show you just a little bit. I'm going to share with you my browser and show you kind of how we approach um, some of our engagement strategies. And we're not gonna go into it too much right now, but one of our key strategies is a thing called surrendering the one up. And I would actually encourage you to go back. You can visit our website. Um, let's see if I can share my screen here. You can visit our website. There we go. Can you see the toolkit I just shared? Yes. If you visit our website, whytry.org, you can revisit some of our past uh, webinars. And we've done a whole webinar on a strategy called Surrendering the One-Up. It's kind of the heartbeat of our whole engagement approach. Um, when we surrender the One-Up, we, what we're doing is we're communicating absolute value towards our kids, letting them know that we value them, that we see value and worth in them, regardless of what their past history is. And we have several strategies, like, like how many strategies do we have for surrendering the one up, Bruce? Close to 50. Close and we have 50. We have more that we're it, working on. What we're doing is we're trying to create a little bit of equity in the relationship and kind of empower them to feel like they're experts in their space. And this applies to all age groups, elementary, middle, high school. Um, when we surrender the one up, we communicate to every kid we work with that they have value and that they have worth. And that's what starts to form the foundation that makes kids want to show up and continue to return. Um, and so my recommendation would be to review that webinar. We, we had a really nice discussion on that. All of our webinars are archived, so you can go back and review them. Um, I'm going to do one other thing before we end up. So we have it within our toolkit, I'm showing you um, what it looks like if you if somebody logs in and and looks at our curriculum and we have all these engagement strategies on this right column surrendering the one up relationship activities um, effective framing using video using storytelling using music um, it's it's right at the core of uh, of everything that we do um, and uh, but one, one thing I want to do, and I hope I don't, I don't think I'm going to regret doing this. I think I'm going to love doing this, but I'm going to do something that potentially is going to overwhelm my, uh, my email address um, to <laughs> model because we, we want to model what we talk about. And so for, for our next webinar, we've been doing these um, almost weekly. I think a lot of you have, have figured that out. And so we'll bring in various thought leaders and we've had some incredible discussions. And uh, what I want to do is I want to build a playlist based on your recommendations. And uh, so I'm gonna give you the opportunity to submit songs 
for our next webinars playlist. And I want you to find a song that either motivates you or talks about overcoming something difficult. And what you can do is send it to me uh, with the uh, in the subject, just put webinar song. So type in your email subject webinar song and you can email me at jason at ytry.org. And I want, I want to put together the most awesome playlist of songs that either motivate you or that talk about overcoming something difficult. And I'll, I'll build our next, uh, our next playlist uh, out of that that we'll use for our next webinar. So if you're willing to engage with me on that, I would love to hear it. I'd love to engage with, uh, with anybody on music. And uh, I think we can put together a pretty sweet playlist. So send the email to jason at ytry.org and put in the subject webinar song and, uh, and send me something that's either motivating or talks about overcoming something difficult. I'll do that as a, a way to engage again with kids. Like I try to create playlists that line up with, with the themes of, of lessons that we're talking about. And uh, hopefully this will uh, allow us to engage with you a little bit more in the future. So anyway, this was a, this was a fun day. Um, I hope we provided you with some strategies that, that um, you're excited about to try and use. And, and the thing I love the most is the discussion in the chat box today, I felt like was really, really productive. There were so many great ideas being shared. We are going to send out a follow-up email with information on how to review this webinar. And we're going to send out some of our slides that we shared. We put some tips up. We're gonna send those out as well. Uh, a lot of people I know asked about those and, uh, and we'll get them out to you. So um, before we officially conclude, Bruce, Corey, any final thoughts? just that we really want to be a support and a resource to everybody. I think we may be looking to doing a sequel where we talk about some strategies of get people just to put, to push on, on their computer. Maybe we've had some, we've been working on it, some variety of things. Some of these things we talked about, they apply to that. But we, I think, anyway, I appreciate everybody and we appreciate what you do and thank you. And we hope to be able to connect with you in any way we can to make a difference. Thank you, Corey. I've got nothing. That's it. I agreed. Well, thank you so much. Um, in conclusion, give yourselves a round of applause. We've almost made it to the end of 2020. Um, I think there's some things going on to hopefully give us some hope for the future and uh, keep doing your best. You're making a bigger difference in these kids' lives than you may realize. I promise it's making a difference and, uh, and we just feel hum humbled and honored to be able to support you. One thing we are gonna offer, um, if anybody is interested in getting like a, a demo on our material, on our, on our uh, curriculum, I'm gonna put up our email address, um, our contact information here. And what we'll, we're willing to, to do is if you're, if you're interested in a demo, we'll actually give you a, access to a digital copy of our book, The Resilience Breakthrough. It outlines our whole model of resilience. Um, it's a great resource. It's got some good ideas of things we call boosters that you can use with kids to help, uh, to help communicate and teach the concept of resilience. But it's also a great personal resource for all of us. Right now, 2020 has been really e emotionally difficult for a lot of us. And uh, to understand a model of resilience that we can apply to our own lives is really useful. So this book, The Resilience Breakthrough, it's a, it's a, it really is a, a great resource that, uh, that we've gotten really good feedback on from experts in the field. I think it can, can help help all of you in your own life as well. So if you're interested in that, uh, schedule a demo, we'll be able to, to get that out to you. Otherwise, I don't have anything else to add other than just a huge thank you. Keep doing the good work and I uh, hope you guys have a, hope you all have a great weekend and I uh, hope to see you back at the next webinar as well. Thanks for being awesome.